open up your Bible to Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19. As you're turning to that, the ushers are going to come back through with our rooted uh, sign-up sheets. If you have new to the church and you've never gone through our rooted experience, it's a 10-week discipleship experience. We only do it two to three times a year, and it's coming up in just a week and a half. It's Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. Uh, child care is provided. It's an awesome way to get connected in the church, and it's only 10 weeks long. So when they bring those sign-up sheets down the aisles, uh, go ahead and fill your name out and info, and we'll contact you. We anticipate at least another 75 or 100 people again going through it this time around. So uh, pump for that. This, this week is the third week of our Underground Jesus Teaching Series. We've talked about our model We've talked about our motto, and this week we're talking about our mission. Our mission statement as a church is to see people far from God discipled into a passionate relationship with Jesus. Last week we talked about all of that hinges on or is the discipleship in our church. And our discipleship huddles, the rooted experience I just mentioned. But what I want to focus on with our mission statement, if we're talking about our mission, we have to truly understand how Jesus reached people for Christ. If our mission is to see people far from God, like think in your mind right now, who is far from God? And if they're in the room right now, will you point to them in the room and we're gonna pray for them. And especially I know spouses are pointing at each other. Like uh, our goal is to see people far from God become passionate followers of Jesus. And so Uh, As I dive into this, I want you to be thinking about very real people. And maybe you're here or you're watching online and you're somebody who wouldn't consider yourself a Christian yet. You maybe are a good person. You're searching out what you believe about the faith. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us online. We started this church for people just like you. We've had people sit in our, we don't have pews, but sit in our seats for years before they made a decision to follow Christ And we have a number of you still coming every week that maybe are agnostic and figuring out what you believe about the faith. And so when we say that we want to reach people far from God, it's not just theologically or philosophically or your worldview, but it's also if you've come this evening and you have some some junk in your life, right? Anybody? We got some junk in our lives that you need to walk through and work through. Uh, This is for you and this is for each of us as followers of Jesus. Look at Luke chapter 19. Uh, beginning in verse 1, Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 1, it says, you guys ready to study God's word together, church? Yeah, I love it. I love this passage. It's one of my favorites. It says this, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of... Josh, 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 you're doing great. I'm back in the booth. Um, This is the story of Zacchaeus, man. I made that video. I thought you were going to show that video I made. (laughs) I'm not showing the video here. I worked really hard on it. I think it's really good. Uh, it's terrible. I've seen it. I watched the whole thing. I've never used green screen before. It's not my best work. <laughs> but I think you should show it. Make it way more powerful if you really want the heart of the story. Use the video, man. <laughs> Come on. All right. All right, Eric. It's we'll powerful. See. We'll see how it goes. If it's terrible like I know it is, we will never use it again. Let me try it again then. It says this. A man, Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was because he was short. He could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he guessed the sinners. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. It was, okay, it was, be- it was better than I thought. How many people like that version better? That gives you some visuals. Finally, verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That that is why Jesus came. Son of Man is a term taken from Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, written hundreds of years before the time of Jesus, representing the Messiah who was to come. It uses that phrase here to say that the Messiah is here, and the reason he came was to seek and to save the lost. 
And if you consider yourself a follower of that Jesus, that's your goal, that's your mission, to reach even those who are far from God. Romans chapter five, verses six through eight says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Will you pray with me? God, uh, we have fun here and we worship you. And on the back end, we're going to get a little serious and share some communion together. Commune with you, Lord. We're going to lay everything at the foot of your cross before we do that. And so we just pray, Lord Jesus, that you would use this time. We acknowledge the presence of your Holy Spirit right now. There may be people in this room that walked in here tonight on Labor Day weekend. All these people came out to the five o'clock Saturday night service because they want to know you more. They want to learn about you. They want to study you. So we pray, God, use this time. Minister to us. Minister to our families. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's family said, amen. I love the story of Zacchaeus because here is a guy, for all intents and purposes, seems like he's got it together. Not too different than many people in North Indianapolis and Hamilton County. Yet when it comes down to it, and I see this so often in all of humanity, each of us here, we desire to be accepted. Even Zacchaeus, who had it going on, wanted to be accepted by Jesus when he showed up to town. And I know that we all want to be accepted because I have seen in my own life, in many of our lives, how we react and respond to certain social situations. Let me give you an example. Uh, How many of you, it's like Labor Day weekend and you've got people coming over to your house? Anybody out there? Yeah. So we've got some family coming into town. We've been hanging out this weekend and will through Monday. And you know when you get together, you got to get everything ready. And I want to give a little lesson to the rookie uh, husbands out there. Any rookie husbands? uh, Yeah, see, this is for you. Brandon, who just uh, got engaged. He's our drummer tonight. Just got engaged this weekend. He, he, uh, this is for you, man. For, For the rookie husbands out there, here's what I used to do when I first got married, and I still occasionally fall to the temptation. I'll meet somebody out hanging out or at work or wherever, somebody maybe I haven't seen for a while, and I'll be like, oh, hey, how's it going? How you doing? I'm doing great, I'm doing great. And before I know it, I'm like, hey, why don't you guys come over to our house? Like right now, why don't you come over? And then here's how the conversation goes. Some of you know this. They're standing there with me. We're like, okay, let's go hang out at Josh's house together. And then after it's all been decided and we're on our way, that's when I call my wife. You've been there? The rookies. And I, I call her up like, hey, honey, yeah, I was thinking about bringing, um, you know, I just ran into Brian and Haley here. We're just going to, we're going to come over to the house. Oh, no, no, like right, like right now, we're going to come over to the house. Now on the other end of the line, there's going, my wife is going, are you kidding me? We haven't done the laundry in two weeks. There are uneaten cereal bowls that have dried in random places in the house. Our kids' diapers have not been properly disposed of. You're inviting who over to the house when? You been there? And here's what we do. We try to pretend. Any pretenders out there? And then I'm on the phone. I'm like, oh, yeah, honey. Oh, that, yeah, I know you're excited too. This is going to be great. We're going to have a great time. We show up at the house. By the time we get to the house, all the uneaten cereal bowls, they've been like stuffed in drawers, right? We've pushed things into closets. There are candles lit now. Kenny G is playing. I mean, it's an event. And we pretend like none of that argument ever happened because we want people to accept us and not think anything about us. You've been there? That's one example of a social environment. I wonder how many times, by the time we get to Luke chapter 19, that Zacchaeus had been rejected by the community of Jewish people that were, were there. And they rightfully would reject him. This guy was not a good guy. He wasn't just, uh, you know, like your average bad guy. He was a really bad guy. It said in the verses there that he wasn't just a tax collector. He was the chief tax collector, meaning the whole Ponzi scheme, he oversaw the whole thing. He was a Jew robbing from Jews to give money to the Romans. Nobody liked him. 
Probably had the house up on the hills with the infinity pool because he had made bank off of the whole experience. And the way that he did it was robbing from your grandmother, literally. There were kids in the community that may not have eaten because this guy had literally stolen money away from them and they could not eat. That's how the, the society worked. So when Jesus shows up in Luke 19 and he sees Zacchaeus there and he doesn't like walk right by him and he stops and talks to him, he's breaking through all the pretension, all the fakeness, all the pretend that we do every single day. And he says, Zacchaeus, I don't care what anybody thinks. I don't care if I get all my dirty laundry out there. I don't care if you do. I don't care if I show up at your house and you got, you know, dried up cereal bowls hanging around. I'm coming over and we're going to hang and it doesn't matter. That's the type of savior, the son of man, the Messiah that we read about in Luke chapter 19 that desires to enter in to your problems. When we say that Jesus is a friend of sinners, we mean it. And it doesn't mean, sometimes as Christians, we feel like we have to give this caveat that, that we have to say, but there's truth and we have to respect truth and God wants to bring conviction as well. Of course that's true. Why do you have to have one or the other? Jesus brought grace and truth all the time. And so when we read these verses and he shows up to Zacchaeus' home and we think about our, our mission statement, and I want you to think about your friends right now or maybe somebody invited you here because they actually care about you and the rest of society doesn't. Our mission statement, that Mercy Road exists to see people far from God, disciple into a passionate relationship with Jesus, it means when Jesus is walking down the road and he sees the short guy up in a tree that nobody likes, he avoids all of the powerful people that would want to encompass his time at that point and stops and talks to this guy. He says, hey, I want to come hang out with you. For the students in the room, think of those people at your school right now whether it's middle school, high school, college, grad school, that right now, everyone avoids. To, to live out our mission as a church, and more importantly, the mission of Jesus, we have to befriend sinners. So if you're taking notes, I'm going to give you three principles of living out our strategy for mission. And I'm going to get to the big one, which is the oikos principle. But the first one I want to make is this, that we as Christians must befriend to sinners. See, when Zacchaeus sees him and he calls out and Jesus responds and invites him down and says, I want to go to your house, Zacchaeus had to have been pumped. Because remember, he's kind of a bad dude. And if there was any reason for him to go up in the tree, don't think it was just because he wanted to get a glimpse of Jesus. There was probably a little of the typical political power move that he's doing in, the, in their culture. Like here is the leading candidate for the Messiah. I want to go get to know him. Maybe if I make a little bit of a scene, I'll get to hang out with him. And it all works out just like he may or may not have planned. And yet Jesus gets beyond all of that. He says, I don't care if you're happy or sad. I don't care if you're divorced or addicted or you're a crook or you've got all kinds of problems in your life like Zacchaeus has created for himself and nobody likes you. I want to have dinner with you. Think of your neighborhood right now of the people that you know nobody wants to have dinner with. That's who Jesus would go hang out with. Isn't that crazy? And so he would befriend sinners that we as followers of Jesus are to befriend sinners. Look at verses seven and eight. Verses seven and eight. Here's what people say when you actually begin to do this. When you actually begin to do this. Verse seven. All the people saw this and began to mutter he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. He has gone to be a guest of a sinner. And then verse eight, but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, or literally it's like, behold, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus doesn't care what everybody's muttering behind their breath and what they're saying about him. All he cares is about this one life. He leaves the 99 for the one. Remember, that's also in Luke 15. So he shows up, he does that, and then look how Zacchaeus actually responds. When we break through the fakeness and the pretension and we invest in a real human being, they respond to genuine love in their lives. He goes, and I can tell you from starting a church that was mainly composed of people who didn't, had never been to church or were not Christians, when we first started this church and we met in our home, 
we would say turn to the book of Genesis, which if you're new to the Bible is the first book of the Bible, and like 75% of the people could not find it, okay? And so when we would do these sorts of things, when we began to love people well, they were actually the ones that invested all of their time and energy into the things of Jesus because they were so thankful for him. And they were thankful for community that loved them like that. We have to befriend sinners. Zach makes a shocking announcement here. I'm giving up half, baby. I don't even care anymore. I'm no longer going to be that guy. It's yours. What could God do with you if you lived out that principle of our mission? to love people right where they're at and befriend sinners. The second point, if you're taking notes, and I gotta tell you, um, this is a little bit of a pause from Luke chapter 19 because I was going over this uh, for our church and I was reading uh, this article by a pastor in Southern California, Tom Mercer, and I I really got convicted that this is incredibly important to the mission of any church, but especially when you prioritize reaching people who are far from God. And that's this that we must avoid the destruction of our mission. Avoid the destruction. On an individual level for each of us in our faith and on a corporate level as a church, we have to realize that we are literally in a spiritual battle. Dude, that every day you get up, the enemy, the Hasatan in Hebrew, it's Satan, he is trying to be destructive to your life and prevent you from living out your mission to help those in need share your faith. He's trying to prevent you from doing that to prevent you from doing those two things, to reach people far from God and and help them become passionate followers of Jesus. And he also wants to do that to us corporately as Mercy Road Church. He wants to do that to our church planting network, Multiply Indiana. He wants to do that to all of the churches in Hamilton County and North Indianapolis and around the state of Indiana. He wants to be destructive to the churches around the world by getting us to fight and to bicker with one another and to turn on people and then begin to gossip about them behind their back and then we tell a little story about them then we unfriend them on Facebook, (laughs) right? And we stop following them on Instagram because they are such bad people. And I want to encourage you, we have to avoid the destruction of our mission. I think of Acts chapter 15 and verse 19. Uh, Luke writes this, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. In other words, that's not saying that we shouldn't teach the scriptures or truth. Obviously, we believe that. But it means that we shouldn't put all of these caveats that somebody has to have a changed life before they can encounter Jesus. Remember the apostle Paul, who used to be Saul, in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus, we named this church after that passage of scripture that nobody farther from God than, than Saul, he'd been overseeing the killing of Christians. He was re- literally a religious terrorist, and he has this one authentic encounter with Jesus. That's what changed his life. He could have had all the people trying to change his habits, right? And that we'd love to do this, change his habits, but it wasn't until he encountered Christ that then it naturally happened that his lifestyle changed, and he began to live on mission with others. Therefore, we should not make it uh, hard or difficult for Gentiles who are turning to God. Now that was a reference to the eating habits uh, in that passage and the particular things happening in the first century in the church, but I believe you can apply that today. 2 Corinthians uh, 11 verse 3 says this, but I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your severe or sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Leave that up there for just a moment because I really believe the enemy would love to be destructive to our mission by getting us to bicker and also to stop following scripture. But do you notice the, the end part there and your pure devotion to Christ? If there's one thing we've learned in the last 500 years of Protestant Christianity is that churches can bicker and split over all kinds of secondary and third and fourth level theological issues. And before you know it, you got a whole church started. Do you realize that the whole uh, Greek Orthodox church split away in the 11th century? Hundreds of thousands of Christians uh, simply over, did the Holy Spirit proceed from the Father and the Son or just the Father? Which is probably a very important theological thing. But how many of you even knew that theological issue even existed? Guys, In our culture today, there are people dying spiritually that will spend eternity separated from God in a a place, I believe, a literal place 
called hell, described in scripture with weeping and gnashing of teeth. And we will debate and bicker over all of these small issues. St. Augustine wrote this once. It's a famous quote. He says, in essentials, unity. Like things that are really important. Let's talk about what, leave that up there for a second. In essentials, unity. Uh, Essentials would be like the first seven councils of the early church where they decided that Jesus was fully God and fully human, God incarnate. It was where they decided in the, of the Trinity and they decided all these major things about who God was and about salvation and how it was through Christ alone. It's not from our works. And so it's these major issues that were decided. And then the Council of Trent uh, refuted a little bit of that. But the reason that that is important is because for us as Christians, we have to hold to those things, the biblical truth, and we cannot surrender those things. And I believe, too, we can't surrender on issues of sin. When the scripture talks about issues of sex and our finances and all kinds of uh, sinful issues, we, we have to follow what scripture teaches because that's going to prevent us from seeing God fully. But when it comes to how churches choose to operate and lead people to Christ, sometimes it's okay to agree to disagree. In essentials, unity. In doubtful matters, liberty. In all things, charity. In all things, charity. Have grace with one another in doubtful matters. Give each other liberty. Another way of saying this is to major on the major issues and to minor on the minor issues. You may not think this is important. You may be new to the faith, but I'm telling you, guys, we must prioritize people far from God, minister to them where they're at, do what Jesus did, which is simply find them, go to them, have dinner with them, telling about the proclaim the coming kingdom of God and how God created you with a purpose and a plan and he's not done with you. He desires for you to live out your full life for him. Teach him who God is, who Jesus is, all these things. But when it comes to these minor issues, to sometimes say we can agree to disagree. In 1 Corinthians 1.10, it says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, my favorite, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Leave that up there for a second as well. See, sometimes when we read that passage, we think that means on every theological issue, we all have to agree on everything, on everything. Have you ever met two Christians who agree on every single theological issue? Anybody? I've never met two people that agree on every single thing. I think it's a misinterpretation of the passage. What it's really talking about there is that we can't have allow these small differences to divide us over the greater mission of leading people to Christ. We must stay united, and we must avoid the destruction of our mission because it goes on in verse 17 in uh, 1 Corinthians 1. It says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. They were bickering over who baptized who. And he says, no, 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 don't, don't do that. Don't, don't take away the power of the cross of Jesus and the salvation that it brings. And he came for us to bring the good news, the gospel of Jesus to people. If you're taking notes, three principles for our mission to be friends to sinners, avoid the destruction of our mission. And on non-salvation issues and non-sin issues, sometimes we can agree to disagree. Amen? And what I love about our church, we have prioritized that. And because we've done that, we've actually seen literally hundreds of people surrender their life to Christ. And we've seen a lot of those people not just surrender their life and pray a prayer at a service, but actually go through a one-year discipling relationship We have seen them go through our 10-week rooted discipleship experience. We've seen them be baptized, take next steps of faith, and now even lead some of our teams in the church because they get it and that Jesus is alive and real. And when uh, the people we're trying to reach are out at the bars on the weekend or at the club, they're not thinking about all these things that you want to make a big deal. They're just not. If one thing I learned in three months of being away on sabbatical and spending time with the Lord was that God loves people a whole lot and desires to have their lives changed, and most of those people that we're trying to reach aren't thinking about what we're doing at our weekend services. But they are thinking about how we love them and we treat them and we befriend them and how we treat each other within our Christian communities. If the third and final point I'd like to make, if you're taking notes, is this, the most important one. Invest in your oikos. 
How many people have been out around here long enough? You've heard this phrase before. So we're going to pass some uh, Greek yogurt down the, the aisles now, if you'd like some. Uh, the, that is literally the Greek word in the New Testament for household. The eighth of 15 in your sphere of influence. So like, if you think about right now at school or at the workplace or at home, who are the eight to 15 that you would consider your extended family? Not just like, you know, your husband or kids or, or not just like, you know, the, your brother or sister. Who are the people that in your eight to 15, your extended family, your sphere of influence that are in your life? When people ask us, how big is your church? Here's how I think we should respond. How big is your church? Well, it's, I mean, it's probably like over 5 million people. So like, wow, that's pretty good. Well, here's what I mean about that. Um, and I think that every church should respond in that way, not just ours. That's not like a selfish thing. Uh, we have prayed since we started Mercy Road Church that over a million people, remember there's only 6.18 million people in the state of Indiana, over a million people would surrender their life to Jesus Christ through the wake of impact that is made for generations to come. And that's happening through Mercy Road Church and now the six churches that are a part of Multiply Indiana, the, the growing church planting network that we started just a year ago uh, in, in partnership with Hope City Church and a number of other churches. And so I share with you the 5 million number because there, somewhere in there are the number of people who on a given weekend won't uh, attend a worship service in the state of Indiana. There's a whole lot of people that have just not found Christ just yet. And it's our job as his followers, our mission is to invest in our sphere of influence, our, our little group. See, I think sometimes we get fixated on the Billy Grahams of the world and that's great. But through most of scripture and through most of the early church and through most of human history, the church did not just expand rapidly by public orators at a large gathering or a stadium. The gospel was spread through individual relationships with people in our lives. Anybody here, anybody here, if you consider yourself a Christian, God calls you and I to live on mission, to reach our oikos, the eight to 15 in our sphere of influence. Tom Mercer writes this in his book about the oikos principle. I love this. He says, oikos, the Greek word for extended family, encompasses our relational worlds, our relational worlds. I wanna make sure this gets up there. Oikos, the Greek word for extended family, encompasses our relational worlds anywhere from 8 to 15 people. On the average, whom God has supernaturally and strategically placed in our spheres of influence. Look, you think that person that has a locker next to you at school just ha like this is random, right? Because their name, well, it's not random. They probably have the next letter in the alphabet right after you. But what if... God strategically named those people and you that that year your, your lockers would collide and you would have the opportunity to begin to invest in them, begin to tell them about your faith. What if the cubicle right next to you at work, God supernaturally placed you together? What if you moved into a house or an apartment and the people right next to you, God intentionally did that? He goes on, he says that God is supernaturally and strategically placed in our spheres of influence and if those relationships frame our primary evangelistic targets, then that reality must from our primary ministry form our primary ministry strategies for the church. Our primary ministry strategies for the church must be to reach the eight to 15 people in our sphere of influence. What's that look like for you? Because you can do it. You don't have to be a good teacher. You don't have to be a great public communicator. All you gotta do is the people that you already have relationship with, get out of your comfort zone and allow God to use you. When we started this church, we used to talk about uh, get, getting uncomfortably close to Jesus. Some of us here and some of us watching online, we need to get uncomfortably close to Jesus in our lives. And that's what's gonna change our society. And I'll tell you right now, I can't believe all of you came out on a Saturday, on Labor Day weekend, this is awesome. Look at these, look at these chairs right here because there, there was less chairs last week. These chairs right here represent human lives that could potentially spend eternity in heaven simply by you and, and I investing in our oikos. That's the way throughout human history, the gospel, the good news is what that means, has spread that Jesus loves you, he's redeemed you, and you can live eternally in heaven with him. So what's all this have to do with Zacchaeus? 
Well, Jesus doesn't care what people think. He's not going to allow that to de- destroy the mission that he came for. He came to seek and save the lost. I don't care who's muttering and who's going to stop it. And then when he finds Zacchaeus and he begins to minister to him, do you, do you remember what happened in the passage? It happened twice. He said, let's go back where? To your house, your oikos. And then when he comes to Christ and he says, salvation has come to who? To this house. Not just to Zacchaeus, it has come to this oikos, to this sphere of influence. In other words, we have this really harmful thing that we do to people. They become Christians, they they surrender their life to Christ, we begin to teach them the ways of Jesus. And when they first found Christ, they got like a nose ring and they got earplugs, right? And they got the pants down here and they got all kinds of stuff and they're cool people. And then here's what happens next. Like two years later, you see them and they look like they've been modeling in J. Crew or something, right? And we begin to say, you need to dress this way. You need to act this way. You need to hang out with these type of people. And don't get me wrong. If you have an addiction issue, if you're going through severe sin issues in your life, you may need to distance yourself from a few people in your life that are being destructive to you. Absolutely. But God is calling you to reach the oikos that you're already in. What we need more people is the first crowd. That's why we've always had people with rings and tattoos and all kinds of stuff because God loves every single person and we're going to reach them right where they're at. And then when they get found, they're going to turn around to their oikos. They don't have to go find some other oikos. They already got one. They're just going to begin to minister to them. That's how the exponential growth of the early church worked when Jesus was around and it still works today. It still works today. Who were the 8 to 15? If you open up your program, there is a little card in there. Uh, this is the second time we've ever done this. And I really, I talked to somebody this week who still has this card from the last time we do it, did it, and they pray about this, this card almost every day. I want you to get that card out. And through this uh, closing set of worship and time of communion, I want you to write down 8 to 15 in your sphere of influence. Th- think who your locker's next to. Think who's on your sports team. Think who's at your workplace. Think of your friends that you hang out with on the weekend. Think of family members or brothers and sisters as well, but go through the whole gamut of your extended family. And as I close, I want to say this. You see, throughout the New Testament, Jesus is in the habit of ministering not just to the individual, but seeing that person go on and spread that to their sphere of influence, their oikos. Whether it's a demon-possessed man in the New Testament or Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19 or a royal official with a dying son or a tax collector named Matthew or a centurion named Cornelius or a Lydia, the wealthy businesswoman in Philippi or an unemployed jailer in Philippi, they were all sent back to their oikos. Our mission is to look at those people and say, I love you the way God loves you. I don't care what junk you got in your life. I don't care how far you are from God. I don't care what other people think of your lifestyle. I don't care how you've been judged by other Christians. I'm just going to love you where you are. And when the opportunity presents itself to present the truth of Jesus, I'm going to do it because I love you. I love you. I've never met a single person who thought that was weird when you did it out of love. It happens naturally, and it's life-changing. And I get, on Monday nights, two of the guys in my outpost that have been around since day one, one of them wasn't a Christian, one of them was going through a whole lot of stuff in their life, I get to love on them every day, and now they've both been baptized in this church, consider themselves followers of Jesus, and continue to try and take next steps, working out some of the, the junk in each of our lives. Maybe God has you here on this weekend because he wants to fire you up to reach your oikos for Christ. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we love you. I gotta be honest. We can teach these things. We can can talk about this on a weekend service, but it takes us getting out of the comfort zone like you did, Jesus, not caring what people think, the Jewish community, the good people, and actually going and ministering to the person who's far from you. Put on our minds right now those in our sphere of influence that we need to minister to. God, maybe some people right now, you can think of uh, classmates in your, at, at school in your junior high or, or maybe at college, people that you live with, that God's calling you supernaturally to reach those very people. Or maybe it's the people in your workplace or your extended family or your brother or sister or maybe it's a, a friend that you live next to or maybe it's somebody you just ran into this week. 
I don't know where you're at, but if you're here tonight and you've known about Jesus, but you want to take a step of faith, a leap of faith, to begin to become someone who truly lives on mission for him, that your life is no longer your own, you were bought at a price and you want to live for his purposes in your life, I want to invite you to pray this with me. God, I confess I'm not perfect. I got some junk in my own life. Forgive me, God, for my mistakes. But I desire to use the short time I've got on the planet to minister to those who are far from you in my sphere of influence. May you use me. I surrender my entire life and my mission in this world to you. We love you, God. The thousands of people that are represented by the oikoses in this room right now, God, we pray that you would minister to those people. Use us, God, not in a judgmental way, but a way of love. We give you our lives and we give you this ministry. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's family said, amen.